All right, so welcome everyone to our third in our series of our online women's forum for Rugby America's North. Uh, we've had two amazing presentations so far and really excited for tonight's topic as well. So this evening, our topic is uh, the road to 15s, creating more inclusive game. We have two amazing speakers that I'm very excited to introduce to you. Uh, we have starting us off, Jen Heinrich, who is uh, the CEO of Girls Rugby, uh, also 2020 World Rugby Women's Leadership Scholarship recipient uh, for 2020, uh, and former CEO and president of Rugby Oregon, will be starting our presentation off. Okay, so uh, first of all, Erin, thank you for the intro. I am super grateful for the opportunity to be here today and um, want to give a sh quick shout out to Fernanda, um, who was really the catalyst behind this women's online forum series, and also to say thank you to Ran uh, for jumping on board um, and supporting this initiative um, for women in, in rugby, uh, super important for all of us, so thank you for that. Um, and as Aaron said, I'm Jen Heinrich, um, and I guess before we get started, I want to kind of um, tell you a little bit about um, who I am, quickly share a bit of my background so um, you can have a little bit of context there. But I grew up as a uh, multi-sport athlete and went on to be a collegiate soccer player. Unfortunately for me, rugby did not exist where I grew up in New Jersey, so I never had any exposure uh, or an opportunity to play rugby growing up. Um, but post-college, I spent the early part of my career uh, working before rugby in marketing and advertising in Chicago and then here in Portland, Oregon, where I live now. Um, opted to stay home for a little bit when my kids were very young and then quickly decided that I needed something to stimulate the other side of my brain and uh, started exploring what my options were. Um, and my husband was my link to uh, rugby. He was my rugby connection and knew that the local state uh, youth organization, which is now Rugby Oregon, was looking to formalize and hire an administrator. So submitted my resume and ultimately was hired for that role. Um, when they hired me, I told them that I would likely be in that job for about a year. I didn't really know anything about rugby. Um, and in that year, I fell completely in love with the game, um, with the people, with the traditions, and with the culture. And I'm sure, like most of you, I witnessed how rugby changes lives and you know the positive influence that it can have. Um, so I felt really grateful for the opportunity, uh, really, to build a program with a strong, positive culture where I felt like I could make a difference in the lives of others. And I really saw the impact that po positive culture um, can have firsthand. So this parlayed into the work that we do with Girls Rugby, um, with our mission to empower girls to reach their potential through rugby and become the leaders and change makers of tomorrow. So, Long story short, uh, my intention was one year in rugby, which has turned into 18 years working in rugby and still going strong and loving it. So a little bit about me. Um, and I also want to start by uh, acknowledging what an exciting time we are in for women's rugby. We are living in a time where world rugby has made the women's game a priority and has identified women's rugby as the single greatest opportunity to grow the global game in the next decade. So. We're starting to see a focus on gender balance, or we are seeing a focus on gender balance. The World Rugby Council is a great example of this um, and creating uh, equal opportunities for women in the game. So um, actually, let me pop over to next slide. I keep forgetting I have slides. Um, so um, as I was saying, um, we're starting to see those equal opportunities for women in the game. And if you haven't had an opportunity to review, and that's what this slide is, to review the eight-year women in um, rugby, the strategic plan, which focuses on accelerating the global development of women in rugby. I encourage you to check it out. You can find it by scrolling down on the homepage of women.rugby. And truly, as a result of the work that's being done by Katie Sadlier uh, for World Rugby, who's currently uh, the GM for women, and Sue Carty before her, we are truly seeing significant success as this work starting, is starting to deliver in the areas of participation with increased participation, um, high performance, leadership, investment, and really elevating the profile of the game. So um, the reason I'm sharing this is this is important because the women's game has momentum. And I know you're on this call like I'm on this call because you're passionate about the women's game. And like I said, we're at a time where we have momentum and um, we can all do our part wherever we are to amplify and support those efforts. So just wanted to call that out. 
um, really quickly. And um, so our topic today, I'll jump right into it now. Um, our topic today is the road to 15s and creating a more inclusive game. So while 15s is the DNA of the game, it's the core of our game, it is important to recognize that we are a game of many formats. So while 15s is played with regularity in the United States and in Canada, it's either not played at all, or if it is played, it's played inconsistently in the rest of our region, uh, typically due to low numbers or other barriers to entry to the sport. However, in all parts of our region, we are seeing programs using sevens, tens, and twelves <clears throat> as the building blocks to 15s, and that's fantastic. It's important that we meet those programs where they are and work together and work toward continued growth and development of those programs. So we know that 15s incorporates some more of the technical and tactical aspects of the game. It puts more players on the field, um, and it can be argued to be more inclusive because it better supports a greater range of body types. Um, however, my focus for today is more about normalizing women's rugby and creating awareness for um, the purpose of increasing participation so that going forward, we have more opportunities and can support more communities who are able to offer 15s for girls and women. And <clears throat> So for the purpose of this discussion um, tonight with Aliha and myself, uh, we're gonna focus on some of the key challenges or hurdles that we face in creating a more inclusive game and growing the game for women in our region. And those areas are gonna be perception, culture, competition, and resources. I'm gonna focus on perception and culture and Aliha is gonna focus on competition and resources. Um, and here's my challenge to you tonight. As we go through our presentations, I would ask you to think about the things that you can focus on to affect positive change in growing the girls or women's game. And know that regardless of where that you are involved, whether you're at World Rugby, you're at the regional level, the union level, the state level, community, local, whatever it is, each of us can make a difference and collectively that can amount to real change. So just think about that, keep that in mind, maybe make some notes as we go through this. Um, next slide. Okay, so. Let's take a look at perception and the old adage that perception is reality. Um, I wanna share a bit about an exercise that we do with the team leaders who participate in Rugby Oregon's annual high school leadership academy. Um, this exercise illustrates the idea of perception and reality. So each spring we hosted um, a high school leadership academy where one or two players from each team were nominated by their coach to participate in a full day of leadership training with some of the top players, coaches, and referees in the country. And we typically have about 80 to 100 student athletes that participating, boys and girls. Um, and we would kick off the day with an exercise where we take out a whiteboard and we ask the attendees to start listing what they hear from their peers, their family members, and their community when they tell them that, um, that they play rugby. And the responses were typically things like, uh, it's football without pads, um, it's violent, it has no rules, it's dangerous, um, and in particular for the girls, rugby isn't for girls, it's a man's sport, uh, manly girls play rugby, it's bloody, etc. cetera. Um, and so lots of negative perceptions. And then we asked our attendees what they think of when they think of, when they think of what, they, when they play rugby, what they think of. And what we would hear were things like, it's my family, or it's a family, or um, you respect your team, you respect your opponent and the coaches and the ref. Um, it's about sportspersonship. It's essential. Sportspersonship, sportsmanship or sportspersonship is essential. Um, it's physical. Uh, you have to work as a team to be successful. And we always hear that it's fun. Um, so for all of us on this call, it may seem like this is pretty obvious, um, but this is always an aha moment for many of the young players as they realize that what the general population thinks of rugby is very different from their reality or their experience with playing rugby. So this is the moment when they come to understand that perception is a barrier to entry to rugby. And I point this out because it illustrates the importance of understanding what the local perceptions are where you live and working to be an ambassador of the game to help change those perceptions. So it's important that we take opportunities whenever we get them 
to be the voice of our sport, to educate others who aren't familiar with the game, to tell positive stories about rugby, um, to share how rugby is a sport that's steeped in values like integrity and respect and teamwork and sportsmanship and all of that good stuff, um, and to share how rugby has positively impacted your life or the lives of others. There's so many of those great stories. Um, talk about how it builds self-confidence and self-esteem in young women and how our coaches are certified to um, safely introduce the key contact areas of the game. It isn't this lawless game. Um, so explain those things to people and use it as that kind of an opportunity rather than to take that opportunity to tell um, what might be a more vibrant story about a gruesome injury or to be the person that jokes around about the number of concussions that they've had. I know a sensitive subject for some of you. Um, but those stories about the injuries and the concussions simply serve to reinforce the negative perceptions that people have of rugby. So I would suggest that you be the voice that changes people's perception of the game to align with the positive values and attributes of the game. So just something to think about as we go forward. Uh, okay. Um, so you may wonder what are some ways that you can be an ambassador to the game, aside from those everyday conversations that you can have in your own circles. Um, we well, can't all be lucky enough to have an audience with Billie Jean King, um, but we certainly can create opportunities for our teams or our clubs to get active in the community and find ways to give back. So as a team, you can volunteer at local events or races. Uh, you can join cleanup crews to help clean up local parks and green spaces. Um, and I don't know if this is just uh, an American thing or if this is universal, um, but you'll see a lot of times that people will have um, car washes to, as fundraisers. Um, instead of having it as a, as a fundraiser, you could offer this service in your community um, as a way to, to give back and um, to create some visibility uh, in your community. So um, finding local nonprofit organizations uh, that are supporting more vulnerable communities. Find out how, as a group, you can volunteer to support those nonprofit organizations. And I know that uh, COVID has created some challenges in this area, but even connecting with like your local pediatric hospital, find ways to connect with sick children. And right now you may be able to be part of a pen pal program if you can't be, be in there in person. Same thing could work with um, the elderly in a, in a retirement center. So some things to think about of ways that you can get active in your community and create visibility inside of your community. But when you do these things, uh, we have to be thoughtful about what that looks like. Think about what our messaging is in those moments and how to take advantage of talking about the merits of rugby in those moments. <clears throat> be sure to represent, we have to be sure to represent ourselves appropriately in terms of how we dress and our communication. And if we're volunteering at a race or an event, always ask, which I'm sure most of you do, can we have a booth? But if you have a booth, how are you gonna use that booth? and be sure that there are materials available so people can learn more about who you are uh, and why your team or your club or your organization is an opportunity worth exploring. So be sure to prepare the people. If it's not you and if it's another group of people, be sure to prepare the people who are representing your organization with the talking points that you want to get across so that your messaging is consistent and on point. So these are great ways to organically make a name for yourself in your local community. Um, but you should definitely get to know uh, your local media contacts. So uh, TV, radio, newspapers, and work to get some coverage. Constantly communicate the things that you're doing to them. And don't be discouraged if they say no the first time. Keep asking, keep telling them your stories and what you're doing, because you never know when they're gonna pick up your story and amplify our voice inside of that community. So being an ambassador of the game, increasing the profile of girls and women's rugby, and changing perception is important on the road to 15s and growing the game because the more that you work to educate your community and change negative perceptions, the more appealing rugby becomes. And the more girls and women will wanna give rugby a try. And the more girls and women who wanna give rugby a try, the more we grow the game. And to get to 15s and sustain more 15s programs in our region, we need to grow the game. Okay. Next step, a little bit about technology and uh, social media as it relates to perception and growing the game. So while we still don't have fair and equal access to digital connectivity globally, 
according to, there's been a recent report, I think it was uh, We Are Social, it was January 2020, We Are Social put out a report that said 4.6 billion people now use the internet and social media users have surpassed the 3.8 billion mark. So that's nearly 60% of the world's population that is already online. So what does that mean for us and what does that have to do with growing the game? What it means is, it means that we have the ability to reach a targeted audience that is more accessible than ever before. And we have an opportunity to connect with people at our fingertips. But we are also living in a world where people are used to having information at their fingertips. So if they can't find it easily, they are moving on. The worst thing that we can do is to build and have an amazing program that nobody knows about. So set yourselves up for success. Have a professional presence online. Have a website where you can showcase your team, your mission and your values and all of the amazing things about rugby and why somebody would want to join and be a part of your program. For existing community members and players, they want a space that's informative and keeps them up to date. For your potential players and fans, they want to be able to find you and they want to be able to contact you. So you want a website that's going to be visually appealing, that's easy to navigate, that has pertinent information, it's up to date, it links to your social media channels, um, and ideally it's mobile responsive since most of us are on our phones looking things up pretty quickly. It's, don't have to want to have to snip in and all that good stuff. And if somebody in your community asks, if somebody in your community uh, knows SEO, which is search engine optimization, that's even better. So SEO will increase the quality and quantity of website traffic by increasing the visibility of your website when people are Googling and using search engines and trying to check out different things in your community. And then on to social media. Okay, so with 3.8 billion people on social media, we want to ensure that we have a presence. The great thing about using social media is that there are no additional costs other than your time. And it's an excellent way to change, to improve, or to build upon the perceptions of girls and, the women's, and women's rugby, uh, which in turn helps us to be more inclusive and bring more people into the game. So I know that a lot of teams and organizations are on social media but I also know, and sorry if you're one of them, but I also know that a lot of them are lacking a strategy. So it's important to have a strategy so that you can leverage social media to help you create your team or your organization's brand and to reach a greater audience. The first thing you wanna do is understand where your audience spends their time. For example, um, if you're primarily working with young people, they are typically not on Facebook. However, in that situation, if the parents are the decision makers, Parents are often on Facebook, so that might be a good platform for you. Um, but each platform has best practices for generating engagement on that platform. Um, and your brand doesn't necessarily need to be on every platform, but for your posts to be targeted, you need to have a strategy specific to the platform that you're using. So in other words, if you're on Instagram stories, you need to be posting more often. Facebook, maybe it's a little bit less, but there's all these algorithms out there and you can do some very quick Google searching and find out what those algorithms are, where you should be, how often you should be posting. Um, so, uh, and then it's also important to be consistent and to focus your messaging so that your followers know what to expect. Um, and, you, and the reason it's important to be consistent, not just consistently posting, but you don't wanna lose people because your messaging is all over the place. So you want to make sure that that messaging aligns with or reflects the values of the team or the organization. So simply put, social media platforms are another platform for all of us to illustrate and communicate the positive aspects of women's rugby. And it's something that all of us can do. Um, another thing about uh, social media is that it can help reduce uh, barriers to participation. So, if you're like me, you've probably had conversations with um, many people who are surprised that there is rugby in your area, let alone girls or women's rugby. It drives me crazy. My neighbors, I've lived in the same house for almost 20 years, and they always ask me, how's lacrosse? So it drives me nuts. But um, social media can do a lot of things for us, though, because it can be easily shared. Your existing community can take your messages that your team or organization puts out and share it on their personal social media pages. So immediately it amplifies your message, it helps you cast a wider net and reach an audience that you wouldn't be able to reach on your own. And I know a lot of this isn't rocket science and I know a lot of you are probably doing some of this, but I want you to think about, are you doing it consistently 
Am I asking everyone on my team to amplify our message? How are we communicating? How are we getting the message out beyond that so that we can continue to grow and continue to be more inclusive and bringing more people into the game? Another great thing about social media um, is that it evens the playing field to some extent so that um, you, know, you don't need a massive marketing or advertising budget to get your messaging out. Um, and unlike more traditional forms of media, you get to control your message. It's an opportunity to put amazing imagery um, and messaging out that is important to you, uh, to your team, to your organization, and to connect with an audience directly. And then kind of last on social media, um, you know, positive byproduct, which some of you may have experienced, but of developing a solid website and thoughtful media strategy is that it can create opportunities to draw sponsors who resonate with your message and who might want to invest in the mission and vision that you're communicating, which is really the golden ticket that we're all looking for. So, um, and if you're not sure where to start, if, you're, if you haven't ventured down this road, you don't know where to start on social media, um, you should be aware that last year, World Rugby launched um, phase one of a three-year global campaign, a global marketing campaign called Try and Stop Us. The purpose of the campaign is to lift the profile of women's rugby, attract new fans, players, and investors to the game. Um, and the campaign, uh, last I read, was had over 10 million views and 500,000 engagements, and there was lots of positive media coverage and all that good stuff. Um, and you can check it out um, and find it and kind of view it uh, at women.rugby and share it. There's a great video on there that you could share as well. <clears throat> but as part of the next phase of this Try and Stop Us campaign, they want to sustain the momentum that they've had and continue promoting the women's game by supporting and empowering the member unions um, and regions to implement their own bespoke women's rugby campaigns. To, so make it specific to, to the people in your community, to the people in your region, people in your union. Um, so where do you fit in? You can be part of the solution um, by identifying women in your community who have meaningful stories to tell and getting in contact with your local union or your local region to identify next steps for promotion. So just to kind of review on that, we know, we know and I, I hope you agree, uh, that we have some perception problems that hinders our ability to grow the game. Otherwise, we wouldn't ha ha be having this conversation probably. Um, I know many of you like me, and uh, you know we give, give our blood, sweat, and tears for, for rugby. Um, and I hope you will give some thought to new ways that you can positively impact change in your community by being an ambassador, um, by working to educate and improve perception, um, by reaching more people as we all work to grow the game to become even more inclusive and increase opportunities uh, for participation. Okay, moving on to culture. <clears throat> First, it's important to, to recognize that the cultural challenges that exist for girls and women to play rugby in our region are many and varied and stem from, in many cases, strong patriarchal societies. So for the purpose of discussion, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna focus more on what we can control, building and strength culture that exists for our own girls and women's rugby communities. So by building strong platforms, strong programs and cultures, within our communities, we can continue to increase participation and break down barriers. So a little bit about culture. Uh, a team's culture, as you guys probably know, is defined as an expression of team's values, attitudes, and goals. Uh, culture can determine what a team is gonna focus on. So they might want to be a team that focuses on having fun or being the best sports in the league or having the best record or um, making the greatest improvement. But culture is really the look and feel of a team or organization and how people act based on the stated mission, vision, and goals. And the reason why it's important to include culture in this discussion is that culture drives results. When a team or an organization is aligned toward a common goal, it directly impacts and drives results. So I'm sure you can think of a team, I know I can think of a team, that may not have the most talented players in the league, but have consistent and continued success because they are aligned, they gel as a team, they've got great culture, and it shows. They're aligned in their culture, they're aligned in their goals, and it shows and how they work together on the field. And that, in turn, drives their results. So if our goal as a whole, as a, as a, as a 
greater community, as a greater, greater regional community, is to be more inclusive and to drive growth and participation, culture is critical to our success. We want to ensure that we are creating or supporting the creation of teams and organizations that people not only aspire to be a part of, but once they're there, they want to stay because there is alignment between the stated mission, vision, values of the team or the organization and the actions of the members in that group. The key here is we don't just want to recruit players to the game, we want to retain them. And if we get culture right, we increase our chance for retention. So retention is often viewed as more important than recruitment. We often focus on recruitment, but retention is often more I would say retention is more important than recruitment because when you get retention right, you're building the basis for recruitment. High retention means your, your members are happy, they love what they're doing, they're enjoying being part of the team or part of the organization, and typically they will share their experience with others, which creates this natural pipeline for recruitment. So the challenge is that creating and maintaining that culture is hard work. We have to clearly communicate our expectations, we have to set the standards on the front end, um, and it's difficult to go back and enforce behavioral expectations after the fact if no standard has been set on the front end. And quite often the challenge for that can lie in the buy-in. So if you have, and I'm guessing you probably can think of an example of this, but if you have three or four people who run counter to the culture, it can derail the team or the organization. It is a total distraction. So it's important to engage your community to get their buy-in. And yes, it is absolutely more challenging to have a larger group participating in that process. But if they don't participate in that process and they don't buy in on the front end, you run the risk of not getting the buy-in and you run the risk of not being able to create a cohesive culture. <clears throat> and then once you get the buy-in and the expectations have been set, document it. Be sure that your mission, your vision, your values are written down and they are published and they are shared. You can include them on your website. You can um, communicate messaging through social media that aligns um, with that culture and that mission, that vision. And be sure that you are continually communicating that messaging to all parties so that it's always front of mind. It becomes ingrained in the culture of the team and the organization. And then most importantly, um, there has to be some sense of accountability. Um, so if the, if the, especially if the actions of, of team members don't align with your culture. So while a code of conduct may seem more punitive, um, it can be helpful in establishing the basis for which you can address behavioral issues that are counter to the culture. And it's critical to address that behavior swiftly or you run the risk of unraveling the culture. Um, so as I said at the beginning, um, we are living in an exciting time for girls and women's rugby. And now we need to do our part at the local level. We need to solve our own problems. We need to control what we can. Um, you know, it takes time and effort, but now is the time to get things done and not wait for others. We need to organize ourselves. We need to form local committees. We need to work to get our local structures right so that we can focus on building our competition and implementing our vision, which really leads us to the second half of our presentation, so, which will focus on resources and competition. So thanks so much uh, for your time today. Really enjoyed it. I wish that we were all in person because it feels really weird talking to my computer screen. Um, but thank you and uh, let's do this. Yes, thank you, Jen. Um, I think two really important topics um, that really can have a positive impact on growing the game, especially as we're working towards those 15s teams. Um, so we have some questions for you, Jen. Um, so we'll take about five minutes and answer those. Um, so one of the first questions uh, was if there are, um, actually I'll let you answer, if there's future plans to, um, to move, expand girls rugby into other countries, um, maybe you can respond to Ruth uh, directly on that one because I want to make sure I get to some of these other ones okay. on your topic. Uh, right. So Ruth, will get back to you on that one. Um, so some of the questions are very similar. Um, so obviously there's a lot of stuff that exists out there that's not positive around the game. Uh, so Joe highlighted one that was um, like they have on Facebook, some of the like quarantine rugby chugging page. So his question is, how can we, how can we have a positive message regarding values and get that message out there as opposed to having these other things that are maybe not so positive and not focused on the values? Yeah. Thoughts? And uh, I mean, it's, it's a great question and it is a challenge and it is an ongoing challenge and it's, it's part of the perception. And I think, 
you know, as we go forward and as we look to professionalize, I guess kind of my answer to everything is it starts with a conversation, right? It starts with the leadership. It starts with a plan. And um, I think the first thing that you can do is, is sitting down and having a conversation with the folks that are involved in kind of the, the negative perception um, and explaining what it is that you're trying to accomplish and how we're trying to grow and build the game and how that's counter to that. Um, I don't know that we're ever going to eradicate that. I mean, it's just, it is part of our culture and that's kind of the way that it is. But I do think that we can at the same time, um, build other pieces to that, right? So if we can't, if we can't always get everybody to change that behavior, we can still build other pieces. We can still put other messaging out there. And I kind of always go back to, um, and this is a little bit off topic, but I go back to girls rugby a little bit. When, when we first started looking to develop girls rugby, um, we did a Google search. And we're like, okay, well, what does it look like for girls in the United States to play rugby? And we found our first searches, we searched it a million different ways. Our first searches pulled up um, women in um, a powder puff rugby gear, like bikini tops and short shorts. It pulled up men's rugby. It pulled up a lot of professional rugby, but there were no pictures of little girls playing rugby. So as much as we want to change some of that behavior, I think we also need to populate our social media and our presence and, and what have you with positive images, with images that start to tell the positive stories and flood social media with those positive stories um, so that we have that kind of, if you can see it, you can be it um, uh, opportunity so that we're starting to change kind of what those things that we're, we're putting out there are. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, um, probably only time for maybe one or two more questions okay. and then we'll save those for the end for those that we don't get to. Okay. Um, Summer asks, are there any resources that you would recommend that we could use to implement some of these ideas around perception and uh, culture? Yeah, and I think, um, I know Aleha is going to talk about resources, um, so she may be able to cover some of that in there. Um, but I, it's a good question. I, I would say if you don't have, um, if you don't already have a plan, I would say that's where it starts. Like it, it's, it has to start with a strategy. So it takes the time to sit down, to be thoughtful about what it is, what are the perceptions. So identify what your local perceptions are and come up with a strategy to overcome those perceptions. You have to understand what the challenges and the hurdles are first. So I don't know that I actually have, I don't, I'm trying to think of Aaron, if there's something I could point to that's a specific resource, but I think it's, a lot of it is, it's taking the time and effort to develop your own plan and your own strategy to address the specific challenges that are in your area, because they're gonna be so many and varied. But I do think it's time and effort and thought and communication that's gonna go into building a, a cohesive and comprehensive strategy to, to, to combat what the perception is and decide what pieces of that, you know, where are you gonna attack it? Are you gonna attack it by being active in the community? Are you gonna attack it by changing your web presence? Are you gonna attack it through social media channels? but sit down, have a plan and come up with a strategy. Yeah, I, I'd uh, add to that. So a lot of unions will sit down and do a SWOT analysis, which yeah. is a very common one to do. Um, but there's there are an immense amount of resources out there where this exists in the business world. This exists sure. in the education world. This exists in a lot of other worlds that doesn't necessarily exist in rugby. And what we can do is we can take those things and turn them into rugby. So one of the things Jen talked about was social media strategy, like making sure that we're putting out the perception that we want to be the perception. Um, you can Google social media strategies and come up with a really basic one that just outlines exactly what you need to do and when you need to do it. And you just plug the rugby stuff into that. Um, so I think there's a lot of good resources in especially the business world, but in some of the other kind of areas that we can then just repurpose for, yeah. for rugby. And I would also say not knowing what all the structures are in all of the areas of our region, but tap into your regions, your unions, um, your state organizations, uh, tap into the, the knowledge base that exists there um, to, to get that kind of support. And I remember having a conversation not long ago with Jen Gray at, at, at RAN and talking about how RAN isn't just a competition structure, it's a resource as well. So there are resources to, to tap into within our community as well, uh, just in terms of kind of that um, people who have that knowledge and education that can help support build those plans. 